in a moment. <laughs> this is the moment. Mm -hmm. Happy Friday afternoon. <clears throat> International Women's Day weekend. Do you feel the power? <laughs> oh, this is something exciting in the air right now. <sighs> Good afternoon, Scano. Mm -hmm. Hello, Hanse. Jerry oh, here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So nice to have you guys. We're here to learn more and absorb all this new, all this new learning for me. Um, and I just absolutely love uh, being in the company of, of the both of you. Great, great way to start our weekend. Yes, so it what, is. What do you want to know? <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> How is all you know? <laughs> Dosa atano de Gariwanondo say also ya atano de Vogada Yondere. Right? As I, as I taught you before, right? Don't ask me anything because I don't know anything. Let me just push that button. Dosa atano a Gariwanondo say also, also go ya atano de Vogada Yondere. There you go. Right? What he said. As I get we older. As I get older, I know less and less. Not the other way around. <laughs> and why? The, why is that? That's why we're here to remind each other. <laughs> That's right. We have to. Right. <laughs> because all these young people keep outsmarting me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this so, is well, wonderful. Uh, well, everybody, stay on there, and we'll. Uh, I'll see if we agree where we're going with our agenda today. I'm going to do a little bit of a a, a recap on the master narrative of the Rodi Noshoni, the Ongwahunwe, which is called the Great Law that we started off on last time, and then uh, go through a little bit about the transition from the philosophy of what is said in the telling of the master narrative to uh, actually how it goes in practice. And then we'll go talk about the whole era from the American Revolution as much as we can right up to the present, which is the era of the what they call Gaiwio or Gariwio, the good message. And I, I guess if that agenda works for everybody, we'll start rolling. Does that work for Sherry and uh, Jody and, and Grandma Renee? Yes. Duda Renee? Duda, yes. Welcome. <laughs> okay, so let's 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 roll with that first video then, Jody, and we'll start off with uh, uh, we'll get into the um, philosophy of it because people say Gaiana Ragoa, uh, but uh, the old teachers that I had called it Gaiana Nesra Goa, which translates as a magnificent goodness, not a great law, and that's c consistent with what the Kyuga say Gaiana Nesra Goa, and with the Onondagas Gaiana Nesra Goa. And the Senecas as well have that sa in there, which is that sura part of that. So let's keep on rowing. Uh, that's who I am, by the way. Toha hoga ni young yats ye so ye so hagene we got that oda sadigariwa de hrono kwajile. That's my uh, uh, clan is sadigariwa de, and uh, that smooth shell turtle is, or my family is sadigariwa de, and my clan is that smooth shell turtle. I think it's a mud turtle. Not sure. Anyway, so let's roll along. And this is the this is the review part of the, today's show. So let's start with uh, the name Iroquois, and this is one I wanted to share with you because this was written by mm -hmm. Pam Colorado as well. And there, there's a whole idea about you know where the origins of the word uh, Iroquois come from. Well. A funny thing about our language is we don't have any M's, P's, or B's in there. So when we say things like Michael, uh, they say Wisse, or if they say Mary, it's Wale, or Peter, it's Guide, and so on. So the, it, the old word from down in um, the Honduras or among the Mayas for up here, Quiche, is Emidiqua. And Emidiqua is what that land uh, from Panama all the way up to the North Pole is called, the Turtle Island, we call it, Emidiqua. And so how would we pronounce that? If we don't say Michael, we say Wisa, or Mary, we say Wari. So it would come out like this, Oyidiqua. So the word Iroquois is actually us saying the name for the land, Emidiqua, Emidiqua. 
And that's my uh, um, idea that I got from people like an Oneida writer named Pam Colorado who talked about it as well. So let's get that out of the way. It's all about nomenclature. Uh, Rodi no Shonigo is uh, people who made a longhouse. Uh, means human beings. Iroquois is actually the name of that whole land. So we'll just say us and we for today. Okay, let's roll along. And uh, how things came to be the way they are, we divided into four different areas. Gunawea Donsara, that's the creation story. Gaina Rosara Goa, which is what we're finishing up with and starting on Gadiwio, the good message. And the last one is Kakarechi Goa, the great swamp elm. Those are the four that we've been talking about and uh, uh, putting in file folders for what we're talking about today. And if I go too fast, that's okay because I've, I've, uh, I have. Uh, I don't want to actually simplify overtly what I'm going to talk about because it is complex, but I want to be clear and not simplistic, okay? So let's roll along. Uh, this is the first wampum, and it's one of the ones that uh, it came about uh, it, when uh, the peacemaker walked among the warring leaders in very ancient times. And this is the basis of what we talk about with our highest good in our society, the conception of the good life. Ah, oh, the good life. What is that? No one eats until we all eat. No one is healed until we're all healed. No one is happy until we're all happy. That's all through our teachings, all through everything that we t are all about. But number one on the list is eating. Eating is the only truth. If you don't eat well, and if you don't eat right, or if you don't eat at all, you're in big trouble. And so the first place that occurred was when <clears throat> the peacemaker was walking around uh, with the, um, the leaders, and they came to this conclusion that <clears throat> this land was symbolized like a big bowl. And we're all eating from that bowl, is what they said. And he said, Dehadi, throw what gadi, ne oni aguego skano, dehadi agafwere. Doga uni, the garden weed, Mahoro, you yana de gene to an e de wayero, than the wayero, the widow at Serio, Skagerat Serat. So while these leaders were wandering around in the beaver hunting grounds, they call that land uh, all around through here, uh, they said, We will eat from one bowl uh, the, the beaver tails. And what they did was uh, the beaver tail looks like this. So they would slice it around like that. Let's see how do I do Slice it around and then pull the leathers off. And inside there, there was a big juicy meat that is what was made into the beaver tail soup that was in that in that dish or that bowl. Skagadatsarat actually is a bowl. And they would say, they said, they made an agreement, a covenant in those days. What do we have done? The Hadigyagut, the way yucks. Uh, so these leaders at that time are the ones on the good path, they said, we will put all our sharp, sharp, any sharp object that we have on the ground by the fire, and we will eat out of this bowl just in case we harm each other. Just in case we accidentally harm each other, we'll leave all sharp objects out of the way and we'll eat this delicacy of this beavers. Now, that's a symbol. That doesn't mean that we actually believed, you know, uh, or that uh, we did all this stuff. We don't know. We weren't around back then, but this is the way they talked in those days. And that's the, the visual images that, the, as they said, this is, whole land is like one great big bowl. And we eat from the delicacies of that, but we make sure that we don't harm each other. And we share, because everybody gets to eat, and nobody eats until we all eat. And that'll keep us happy, and that'll keep us healed so that we're, we don't afflict each other. And so they, this is where it starts with the idea of that sign and symbol of culture, that wampum belt. That was made a long time ago by our ancestors and handed down to us, their children. I had to start there and I wanted to take some length to start there because they describe all kinds of signs and symbols of the wampums, the circle wampum, the iron walk, they call it the iron walk belt, they call it the, uh, the, uh, the league belt, the dust wing, all of these things. But it starts with this bowl. And that's clearly stated in the great law that when they came to peace, they would eat from one bowl. 
and later on they made the belt that commemorates that event. Let's keep on rolling. So the idea, remember, in the uh, creation, there was a tree in the sky that was pushed over and Sky Woman came down to the earth. Well, the agreement now was to, was to plant the celestial tree on earth, which we commemorate as the great tree of peace that is uh, pictured there. In other words, heaven on earth. In the great peace, and in the, as they formed up the league, there were three different parts of the great law that are actually performed. One is that deals with, uh, first of all, this is um, the people, the mothers, and the chiefs. So they take three days explaining what happened to the chiefs and how the chiefs were really bad people in, in the old days, cannibal sorcerers and warlords. And they were set aside to walk on a good path. We don't have the name chief comes from chef, the cuisine <laughs> in French, but that's not accurate as to what these men were called. But Odia Neso is that they're on a path. And so they're a good example to us of what a good way to be in our society. And as it's described, they ended up being almost like a Supreme Court. In other words, they would remember all what we did, what they said, the decisions that were made. And they would then say, this is what they said in the past. This is how they did it. And this is what they did. This is what I think. You people govern yourselves accordingly, just like a court. Govern yourselves accordingly. And then let's talk again. Second three days, it talks about the mothers and uh, the women who actually ran the civil society or the villages and towns. And you had a, a head mother who was chosen by the women to speak for that uh, clan or that family. And they did the day-to-day -day they did the day-to-day -day business of running the society, building things, birthing babies, picking medicine, uh, storing food and so on. So the day-to-day -day activities of the people was governed by the women who, and the reason why it was perfectly straightforward. Who best to know who knew what, who had the skills, who were the experts, but the mothers who watched the kids growing up. While the men were off doing other things that men do, the mothers were actually watching and knew all of the gifts of the children. And so they would say, this one is going to be uh, um, uh, a lodge maker. This one is going to be a medwife. This one's a medicine person. This one is actually pretty good at the stars. This one is, you know, and, and so on and so on. So they knew, and that's how they were able to govern over the day-to-day -to -day affairs of the people that went on every day. The last part of it in the last three days has to deal with the rights of the people. And they begin with a, uh, a description of how the people were driven to despair and ruin in very ancient times by sorcerers, warlords, and cannibals. And that the uh, great peace would then bring light to the sky and protect the women from uh, and men and children from any despair and ruin that would take their happiness away, that would take their food away, that would hurt them. But you have in that section then the whole idea that all the individual rights of all the people were uh, protected by the chiefs and clan mothers and the people that ran everything. But the people also had their own fires. So there were skin tanners had a fire, midwives had a fire, pottery makers had a fire, lodge builders had a fire. So you had all of this division of labor, they called it. And all of these individual fires uh, had their own, they had a stake in what they did. So look at skin tanners. Don't come over to the pottery makers and tell us our business, unless you want to become a pottery maker too. Then come on and we'll teach you how to do that. But other than that, it's none of your business what we're doing over here. That's kind of how it's said. So there was a protection of self-interest, and that's how it was divided up, and that's how the great law is actually performed over the 10, 11 days where they talk about the chiefs and how they were then uh, put into a, a position of day-to-day uh, -day affairs of the people that were governed by what they said in the past, what they did in the past, how they did it, what I think govern yourself accordingly, almost like a Supreme Court. Then the day-to-day -day operations, the executives for that were the mothers. They ran everything. But also the people had their individual rights protected by these fires called the people's fires. It wasn't one great big fire that all the people came to. 
Sometimes it's I it's none of my business what the midwives are doing. I'm a lodge builder. Want to know how to do that? Come on over and I'll show you. Let's keep on going. Uh, the basic one again, we'll come back to the binary. The Degani Johade, the two row, we're all on this together. So we have mutual aid, mutual defense, and mutual support and respect as part of that whole binary. And that was the basis or that came out of the unification then of the five nations, those war warring nations that were governed by sorcerers, warlords, and cannibals that agreed then to try to create heaven on earth and that we're uh, uh, walking uh, a path together. Uh, we're on a road together uh, as a binary. Let's keep going. And that many built this house, not just one person built the, the house, uh, the house that became the, the eastern door were the Mohawks, the western door were the Senecas with the Oneidas, Onondagas, and Cayugas uh, as rafters in that house. And so they have this belt uh, that depicts then uh, how uh, the meaning of that, that many built the house, right? Many built the house. Keep on going. And in theory, we won't harm each other. We will share. The symbol is the one dish. Let's keep on going. And that we will build consensus so that everything we do is about finding a win-win solution to make everything happy, everyone happy. We're not going to vote on this. Five people are miserable or win. Four people go away miserable. We don't do that. We try to have all nine people build consensus. That creates peace. It's harder work, by the way, than just a simple majority vote that nation states do. True democracy that we have created in the Americas here is depicted in, in this great law takes hard work. It's hard work to find the answer to make everybody happy. Let's go again. So the governance structure is about then uh, the idea of building consensus among uh, various interest groups. And we'll go. And so you have the Bear Clan. And the way that it's talked about among the folks that um, uh, helped me to try to learn this is that the bears, these names here, weren't names of people. They're names of a function that a family did. So you have this bear clan title that kind of means the rattles or it's sticky. Like it's uh, their job is to say something's, uh, this is a problem here. You know, let me let me be the rattlesnake rattle and warn you. Watch out now. Be careful. The other one, drag the horns. Uh, something gets stuck on the horns. So that family's job is to get it off the horns. Let's see. We're caught up here. Let's let's get something caught uh, on 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 block from the horns of this dilemma that we're in in our discussion. That's their function. That's their portfolio. And Zaskara Harone, the Bear Clan family, is the one that blocks the stream. In other words, this is not going anywhere. We need more information to make a decision. So I'm stopping this discussion now. That's their family's job. So in the council, their whole role is almost like protecting the den. They're bears protecting the den. Watch out for the cubs. Okay, we got something that's bug bugging us here. Let's try to get it loose. And the other one is let's block the stream and we're not talking about it anymore because this could be this could lead us to make a bad decision. That's the bear clan's uh, portfolios. Let's go another one. The turtles. Everybody wants to be a turtle. I know that. So we have the three then, Iowata, Degari Hoga, and Sadigari Wade, and they also have a function. As they're called the well, things come in through uh, to be placed on the floor for discussion. And that means that uh, you have the Iowata clan, their job is to untangle things, they comb the hair. 
Uh, Degarihoga has two minds now. Let me see if I understand the way you're thinking about this. That's their role. And Sadigariwode is their, the mediator between points of view. Okay, so you're saying this over here and you're saying this over here. So let's mediate the two points of view and try to put them together to find out a solution. So that's their function. That's a portfolio. That's, they're not people. That's a portfolio of uh, people. But the way they tell the story, it is people. But in the function, that family's job is to untangle things in the discussions. Uh, let me see if I understand what you're saying. The other one is, well, that's what you're saying over here and what you're saying over there. This is the thesis. This is the antithesis. Let's put them together and create a higher synthesis and continue. Okay, let's go on. And actually, throwing things to the wolves is a, is a phrase that comes out of this whole thing. If you have something that you think is really good, you know, and you say, uh, we think this is really good, well, throw it over to the wolves and see what they think. And they'll grab it and they'll go like this and they'll wreck it all around like wolves do. And they'll say, and then when they finish and it's all wrecked up, they'll kind of go. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how wolves are. But they have three functions. Oran Rigoa is the eagle on top of that tree of peace who sees uh, anything that comes in. Uh, you go to that family and say, here's something that's coming to the people and we would like to see if it's a threat or a benefit. Like, this is just the example, the invention of the canoe. Is that a good thing? Uh, well, talk to us about it. So you go into the wolf and Ron Ragoa, that's the one, he'll tear it to shreds and then he'll say, fix it up. It doesn't go any more further until you fix up these issues with it. Deo Hekwa in council. Let's grapple with this. Let's let's grapple with this issue, okay? Let us test its strength by grappling, just like getting it in their jaws, right? And Zaran Hoene is the other wolf uh, uh, portfolio family that is the tall tree. Okay, let's look at this from another point of view. Let's look from another perspective at what we're talking about. Let us see it in a different way. So you have those nine portfolios, and I'm just talking about the Mohawks here. I'm not talking about anybody else's uh, uh, way that they think about how this works. I'm just talking about what uh, has, the way I learned it from people that talk about it, that those are the uh, portfolios that actually, when you think about it, makes a pretty good decision-making system, and your man or per, your chief or the one who's on a good path who speaks for each of those portfolios is chosen because of his special skill in being able to perform that task, right? Okay, let's keep on going. So in theory and in practice now. So we stand to reason. That's a, an important thing when people stand in council, they stand to reason. And that being reasonable and pragmatic is, 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 is treasured. It's actually privileged. That's a reason. She's a reasonable person. He's a reasonable man. But the way it's described here is that they're uh, med meditative. They uh, um, are thoughtful about what's being said. They look at the pluses and minus. They're not uh, in uh, what you'd call it uh, uh, invested in anything. And that's the whole way the decision making works among uh, men, women, elders, bears, turtles, wolves, and so on in that tripartite decision making process. That is the, the foundation is the triangle or the tripod is a strong structure. If one of them's missing, it falls down. And that's the basis of the idea there. With how it is in practice in the decision making that is put on the floor after the wolf chew it all the shreds are on Ragoha and it gets all fixed up, it comes in and then the turtles put it on the floor. They talk about it at length, they present all the 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 issues about what we're talking about, watched over by the bears who are there protecting the den. Don't you do anything that'll mess with my cubs or the cubs is the thinking that goes on. Okay, let's keep on going. So today, uh, and this is where we, uh, uh, I'll just leave this off uh, as we move into Gaiwio now, as to say that 
you had uh, uh, very bad people running our affairs that drove the people to despair and ruin. And in the dark times, uh, cannibals, sorcerers, and warlords uh, uh, exploited and, and made the people's lives miserable. And so the peacemaker came and he met the first six people that they talk about in the master narrative. We're, we all had mental health uh, profiles that we will know as uh, uh, um, uh, bullying. They were bullies, uh, narcissists, uh, oh. grieving, uh, you know, and that in all of those cases, uh, uh, they made a decision to change after being critically reflecting on who they are, what they did, and why they did what they did. Those were the three questions. Who are you? What do you do? Why do you do that? And after talking to uh, Adudarho, the handsome cannibal, Jigon Sase, Ayanwata, Digarioga, and Sadigariwade, they were able to make changes that then formed the league. And the league was is officially called, and this is right up, the elders say this right today, what we're called is the five nations. That's the legal name, Wisknahoda Winchake, that consists of those five original founding nations. And the 12 founding families of that league, right to this day, the elders say, need to be present for any functioning of that league. That's Ayanwata, Digarihoga, Sadigariwade from the Mohawks, Lodatsede, Ganakwayoda, Deohekwa from the Oneidas, Deon Taregwa, Deon Horonko, Degayanyo from the Cuyugas, Skanyat de Deon Sadigarones from the Onadwaga, the Senecas. And the last one, though, is the way it's taught, Adadarho. Now, there's a kind of an idea that Adadarho has to be Onondaga, but that's not what it says. He is the chair of that whole function, and he can come from any of the five nations, actually. So Adadarho does not necessarily have to be Onondaga, but from anywhere in the five nations. And who sits number 12 there is Onibireto, the long wampum in the middle of the circle. So what happened was after all this time, and here's where we're now we're going into the guy wheel, is that Buffalo Creek in 1838, the league uh, went their separate ways. They covered the fire, they said, and everybody took their fires and went their separate ways. And the idea was that they would be able to uh, look after their own affairs where they lived until they rekindled the fire at some later time. This is what was said in the last part of the great law as well, is that there'll come a time when the people are gone down almost as low as they can possibly go. And as the peacemakers said, the reason why we did this great law is to protect the people from despair and ruin. And we would see that at that time, there's going to come a time in the future when uh, uh, things happen among the people and we're disarrayed. The leaders are mocking each other and the people live in despair and ruin again. But watch out, if you mock the great law, things will happen to you because the great law is practical common sense. And that's the most important feature of the foundation of all this, it's common sense. Everything is common sense about it. Uh, there's nothing, uh, uh, what you would call superstitious about it. It's all common sense. And this is the way it was talked about uh, in the great law recitals that I have been to and in studying and talking with people about their understanding. And there's a lot of different ways of looking at this. This is, I'm trying to actually be fair to many of the different ways I've heard this from all the territories, Ganesidage, Agwazasne, Ganawage, Tayantanego, and here at Oswego. So that's, we're going to put a bow on the great law now, and I'll ask uh, uh, Renee for a response to what I said while uh, Jody gets ready to move us into Guy Wheel. It's so nice to be, um, to take that path again. Um, that's why we are told to always, um, to be always listening, because you always remember another thing, another thing. And this is why they use that circle to remember, to remind each other, a piece of that that information that was shared a long time ago and that's why our people use metaphors metaphors that was the first language and everyone knew at a very young age because who was our teachers always our mothers but also the animals and this is what we would be reminded of daily daily when we see these the characteristics 
of those animals because they had they created ethics and values and so this is how how we were taught and it's so amazing because um logic look at the animals look at the how they how they um govern themselves and um who is our who is about us all the time was these animals and so if someday we we were misbehaving or something it, it just seems like um this animal would come to appear and it would go oh yeah that's what because we were taught at very young ages you see and we had all these stories these stories of how they reminded us of how to be how to be a good human being and that was to use logic and so this is they say that many of our, the old ones would say this is why it was to be very simple that so that the smallest child whenever they were sitting there they were playing they could hear this and they would they would remember because they would see this reminder on a daily basis and it's so nice that we have this um the recital of the the reading of the great law because now people are becoming more and more conscious of of this and of these metaphors these symbols and it's like a real re renewing our fire that knowledge that we hold in all all of us and this is why the creator made it so simple so simple that no matter who what nation you come from you will see and you will understand that these words that we have shared we 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 parallel it to the natural world so that there would be um a purpose and that's why everyone when we look at our children we saw the characteristics of the, the animals and by doing that a lot of the old people would say ah oh, look at how their mind works they are just like this is why it was so important that we we um, had, as they say, um, live food. These animals. This was the whole purpose of, of of our meals, because the animals that we ate give us the those skills, those those um, as they say, characteristics. So a father would look. And he would go out and he would find those animals that had those skills and he would bring it back and we would eat them. And that's why to this day, we are to eat, we are to take of the wildness, the wild food, so that our minds would be able to function with logic. Today, our children are fed the wrong kind of animals. This is why they're not, as they say, um, in that mode of survival because they're there they have another understanding of life it's like how the animals are today the residential animals and they're always being fed so the children don't know how to how to take care of themselves and another thing they're taking away is how the animals are now becoming house animals they're now going to be losing their instruction because the people <clears throat> the people have forgotten and this is why my father would always say, no, these animals they have, you can't take them from that environment. And so even though the coldest winter, the animals would survive outside. So they taught us so many things. And how it's explained is so, so natural. This is my purpose. As a young child, I would know when I look and see these animals. See, even though I may be of a different nation, different clan, it's a reminder when I see them. That's what I have to be. And so when I see, well, some days when I'm, my mind is troubled, I look and I see a hawk. Now, what does a hawk mean? Well, there's many things to it. And this is why our people understood even having the trees the trees have a characteristic that we each have to know and there was an, uh, uh, an elderly woman that had much wisdom about the tree life her name was Twyla Nitch and I spent much time with her and she talked about the how the trees have their 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 families and so again 
our men looked at what to build our homes, what to, how to do survival to help our minds. And see, even burning that, that log, the, the, that certain tree brought back memories. And this is why they say, always use your senses. Use those five senses. Listen, listen to the trees. They're talking all the time. The trees have that internet long before people did. They knew when to all, they were all in sync. It was just like the tree, the chiefs. That's why they use the um, the pine tree chief that's standing beside him. And this is how we call mentors, that they always will grow side and they will take over. And this is how we looked at everything in natural, the natural world. That showed us how to govern ourselves, how to take care of ourselves, how to relate and, and handle difficult situations. So hearing it, you're hearing it two ways. You're hearing it from the natural world element and how they are still here to remind us on how to live. And so you see, when you look out and you see these trees, they have a purpose. And that's what our children need to know again. What is my purpose? You see, they've forgotten. What is my gifts? Just like all creation has their gift, we can do many things. Yes, we want to. My father would say, we will teach you to be a jack of all trades so that you will learn. Just like the animals, they learn how to live together. You will take notice of each of them so that you will be able to survive and that you will be able to help, but most of all, to share that dish with one spoon. All those animals come together and they give their gift to us to help us to, to function in a good way, how to relate and how to communicate. So you see, this is very um, ancient, ancient knowledge, but it's still there. It's still there to help us to lift up to lift us up again, to remind us and more and more people. This is why they are now coming back to the parks. They are coming back to the trees. They are coming back to the, the plant life. And they are realizing and just the other day, I saw things that, that kind of, this is our weathermen. This is our, our, our reporters. They go and they see everything and they come back and they tell us. And if you're in touch, you do not need television. Our people knew how to survive, how to overcome and travel great distance. It is because this is how the animals taught us. And this is how they taught us to be good human beings. And that is that magnificent way of understanding life. I have a purpose. And ever since I was born, who was my teachers? Was all those little ones, those, the ants, how they came together and they showed us to work together. And how they share life and how they take care of the land, the maggots, all of them. They show us how to look after this place that we call home. So you see, they are part of the original instructions. They are the, also the ones that we should include in our great, the, our great messages that we are to be given. And so I explain it in a grandma's way, how the grandma would see that. And then this is what I would tell my children, see that tree over there? Well, he's a great leader. He's a great leader because you look beside that tree, there's another one and he's gonna be talking to him so that they grow tall and strong together. So when it comes time, when he's no longer able to think in a good way, or it's time for him to step aside, this other one will have all that knowledge. You see, he didn't have to run for with money and say, vote for me. He was already groomed. And that's what's the most important thing that I always remember from being out there in the woods and how the, this is where is our classroom. This is how our grandparents taught us walking in the woods was saying, now look at that animal, look at him. And I want you to watch him, he'll be there for you. And so this is why we have them as our helpers.
Can we roll along with the slides and I'll come back to what some of what uh, um, Duda Rene was saying. And what we're going to talk about is the time from the American Revolution to the present that we know about. And it's called Gaiwio by some people, Gaiwio in Mohawk. And they usually attribute it as the teachings of Handsome Lake. But it's also looked at as a time period. So we had Ganawira Donsara was the first era, Gaiwira Goa, the Great Law, is the second era. Following the American Revolution up to the present time is the era of Gariwil. This is what happened as we uh, had to think about some of the things that uh, Handsome Lake, uh, and I'll come back to him in a second, uh, reminded us about in the way his understanding of how things came to, are going to be as he saw it. Let's keep rolling along here and we can move, move through this. So change came to our people. And it had to do with, uh, and there's a whole library full of books about what happened with the American Revolution, the formation of the colonies. You can go read about it. The English and the Americans collaborated to squeeze our people in the middle, that you had uh, factions of the business community, the power elites on both sides colluded with each other uh, to squeeze us in the middle. They, the English lied over here to the king saying, we're all out of bullets, so we can't fight. And they left uh, hung us out to dry. Meanwhile, the storehouses were full over here. That's all in history. I won't go into that because it gets into a victim. Oh, we're victims of, okay, we're not going to do victim. We're going to talk about what happened the way we understand it. So let's keep on rolling here. So what happened in the 1700s was that the actual, our leadership became corrupt. The chiefs and clan mothers came, became corrupt. They had gone to England and saw how aristocracy lived inside walls. And so in the middle 1700s, walls went up around all the big towns uh, that you had uh, over at Ticonderoga and uh, Saradoga and Kanajohari and uh, 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 Onondaga. And so you had they, they, they turned it and it was even described as castles, Onondaga Castle, Oneida Castle, Kanajahari Castle. And believe me, English people know what a castle is, right? But this is the, uh, the uh, population before the American Revolution in the, the major towns of the, uh, the League of the Five Nations, Wisnohonimachaga. So you had four Seneca towns, about 40,000 people living there. The two Cayuga towns, upper and lower Cayuga Lake, uh, 18,000. Onondaga near Syracuse, 12,000. Oneida near the Oneida Casino today, 10,000. And the three Mohawk towns. Uh, can you scroll it down so I can see the numbers a little bit? There they are. And the population in the Mohawk towns is around 57,000. They say there were 30,000 or so that lived in Kanajahari or Ganajohare. But... That's the general uh, uh, census on the population that lived in the towns. These are the major towns now where the chiefs and clan mothers hung out. Okay, keep on going. And so there was a kind of an idea of a nobility that came up. And they asked, the population is estimated at around 1,250,000 uh, Ngwahunwe at that time and 130,000 uh, of the noble families lived in the towns, the big cities. Brandt, at that time, could see what was going on between the English and the Americans, and he tried to convince the chiefs and clan mothers to stay out of the White War. He did. It's, it's, he's usually blamed as the one that got us into the war, but it was the nobility that got us into the war. And it's in his memoirs that he wrote down when he went on a private trip to England by himself to see how, how they really lived. And he saw the aristoc aristocrats inside the castles and all the poverty and all of that outside. And he came back and he said, I don't want this to come to our people. And so that whole story about him banging his uh, 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 tomahawk on the railing at, Fond at, at the hall in Fonda, New York, Johnson Hall, uh, angry over being dragged into the war, had to do with his frustration at the leaders for getting us into that war at that time. So I would say beware of uh, trying to throw Joseph Brandt under the bus and blaming him for everything that happened to us. You can't do that. No one person is to blame, just like no one person could build that house. Keep going. So uh, Joseph Brandt, uh, as well as Corn Planter, I must say, 
they were called Gasanahoe Lomadiguana. They were the real names of the big people. Uh, only way I can translate that in English is they were the president. John Joseph Brandt was the president of the Mohawk Nation. I'll say it that way uh, because uh, uh, that way you understand his place there. And his role was to execute the decisions that were made by the nation. That's his job to make sure things got done. And his uh, title name was Ayongwes, who was stood up by the Degarihoga family, nominated to the rest of the Mohawk people to be the president of the nation. It's the same as Corn Planter. Uh, 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 Sonadatawana was his name, and he was raised up by the Scanyadario family. Uh, Allendez was one for the Onondagas, Gahuadiro for the uh, uh, for the Oneidas, and Wunus was. They were all the five Casanahue uh, de Madagawana presidents, and the mothers had all, as as Renee said, pine trees. Onkanedoda is what they're called, or who has uh, who is a pine tree. And that, those were the masters of our arts and sciences. So you had somebody who was the master or the, the, the head midwife. And you remember the little fires that were in the society? So the head midwife was the master of midwifery. And you had the lodge builder, the master of engineering, you might say, and so on. So you had all these masters. That's what the pine trees were. They they grew up. In other words, they had a special skill or expertise. And so you had all of those people, but they had come under the control of the nobility in that time. After the war, after the American Revolution, this is how they talked about our all the leadership now and all the knowledge was attacked. And we went from 1,250,000 people to 40,000. That meant out of 125 people, four were left standing. So if you have 125 people in your family, wipe all of them out except for four. That's what happened to us. A great trauma was given to our people at that time. And that 40,000 people were spread from Niagara to Quebec, Ontario, Oklahoma, Wisconsin. There's some way out to the Rocky Mountains at uh, uh, Victor Lake, Alberta. And these people are all part of a, a, a Mohawk, or I mean, uh, Rodinoshone, Rodinoshone diaspora, Ungwahui diaspora. Forced migration, relocation, and, and removal was what happened in the late 1700s. Let's keep going. Oh, yeah. And of course, uh, it's well known in history, too, of the uh, destruction that took place with this, the sacking and burning of Ithaca, the sacking and burning of Onondaga, sacking and burning of Aganajohare, and uh, the uh, one person who is the architect of that, uh, a Freemason named George Washington, who is known among our people as the village burner. Keep going. So... What happened after that? No, this is where I'm going to, uh, this is some of the sources um, that uh, people have talked to over the years and got writing from and uh, uh, Chief Thomas and uh, Faith Keeper, uh, Huron Miller, and there are a lot of ways of finding out information, but you got to go talk to them about what's going on. And so this is where I'm going to start with the guy wheel with that era after the American Revolution, when that trauma was delivered to our people that hurt. And the question is, we'll come back to that. Have we recovered from that trauma? Eight generations later, have it? Is it intergeneral, intergenerational transmission of that trauma to the present time? Keep thinking about that. Let's go. So the idea about the religion is now a part of the discussion. There's spirituality versus religion. And the idea is a religion tells you what to do uh, spiritually, uh, spiritual people think of uh, what they're going to do. And so religions say something happens to you and, and that there is a, a holder of ultimate truth who has the answers, right? So I'll put that slide up there. Now, as, as you're watching this, of course, you can pause your button and read the slide. So I'll uh, I'll give you an opportunity to do that. But when you read the slide, see what's where it's a discussion about the difference between religion and spirituality. So keep on going. So you remember that there were 12 founding chiefs of the, of the League, 12 founding families. Skanya de Rio was one of them. And that uh, Onadawaga uh, turtle family title uh, is 
kind of interpreted as a balance across the, the expanse of the water. They say it's Lake Ontario. Uh, okay, some people say that. Beautiful lake is another way it's talked about. Let's go again. And Hatawako was the uh, given name for the man who held the portfolio of Scanyat Darío. Right? And this is just a little uh, b uh, profile of his life. And one of the things that they talk about is this, is that in his life, uh, 15, they began teaching his, about his, uh, his teachings 15 years after he died. Mm -hmm. And that Gaiwio became codified in the late 1800s. Their first version was actually written down in 1850. And it was taught in at Oswego by John Arthur Gibson, who was the title holder for the Scanyat de Rio, who ac actually uh, compiled a book on the great law uh, written down in Onondaga. And uh, as I showed you the title of Jake Thomas's book, he said that the code actually became a religion in the, mid, in the middle 1900s, around 1951, as they say in... Uh, uh, it began at the Seneca Longhouse over here, and it's also shown in the National Film Board documentary, The Longhouse People, all the key part people who were involved in actually establishing uh, the Haudenosaunee uh, uh, Guy Wheel. Keep going. Uh, so you see the relationship now of corn planter and Hadwago is, uh, and this is all out of the way it's taught, is that their father was a white man named Johanna Biel. It's, okay, it's just facts. And after the war, he became an alcoholic. And as the story goes, he uh, had become so sick after being torturing himself and self-sabotaging with alcohol that he seemed to die. And so uh, they they said that corn planter and the and the men were going to get ready to bury him, but a, a woman actually came in. One of the elder women said, "No, hold on here now. You better send for De Haya Don't Song." That means he sat down the spirit. So this man came there and ran his hand over the top without touching Handsome Lake's body stopping around the stomach, went over that. They don't say how long, but it's described that he went over several times. Then he said, no, there's still life here. So they didn't bury him. And as it turned out, he was still alive. He was just in an alcohol-induced coma. But while he was in that coma, he saw a lot of things that became part of what he taught about. But again, here's another thing that's important about the code and what's written about Handsome Lake is there's lots of indigenous knowledge there. Everybody says, oh, Reiki, that comes from China. Well, hold on here now. There's a guy who actually, De Haya Don Het Son, who actually sat down the spirit who did what is now known as Reiki. So we did do that. It's not from China. We had it. And there are people, de hadi adohetso, there are people who do that, right? I just wanted to talk, share that with you, that there is indigenous knowledge in there. And this is not an argument about his divinity or anything like that. This is just saying what's there. And you decide what you think of it. Let's keep going. So the idea is to uh, recover. We went from 100. 1,250,000 to 40,000. We had a great trauma delivered to us, and we had to recover population, uh, maintain the great law that uh, everybody gets to be eat, eat, heal, and be happy. Uh, but there's a modern word, world that's coming to us, and we need to get ready for the great swamp elm time, the fourth era. That's all part that's inside the, the way that the teachings have come down. Go ahead. So, first sin. A drink, uh, the mind changer, they call it. Okay, and the very strong admonition on the part of uh, uh Hadwago to say to people, uh, the mind changer should be avoided. That's the hard liquor, whiskey, rum that was driving people crazy. Let's go again. Next one is uh, the medicine of the women was forbidden in those days. And this was interpreted as uh, the idea that it was an attack on women. And you'll have to think about this, too, because they, uh, they, they, they sometimes have a big 
uh, discussion about women should have 12 babies. Okay. So you almost got wiped out from 101 million, 250,000 to 40,000. Somebody's going to have to have babies. We need to repopulate. But there's a lot of discussion then about how that disempowered women and their role. And they were blamed. The clan mothers were blamed for getting us into that war. That's where this comes out of. There was hostility towards women and getting us into that war. I'm just saying what other people have said about it. Whether it's true, real, I don't know. I wasn't around back then. But it came through in this these teachings that had uh, uh, restrictions placed on women. Okay, That's a trauma as well, by the way. And that the... There is, he doesn't actually replace the great law with the guy wheel. Actually, he affirms the great law and all the ceremonial practices, everything that we do and know that comes out of the great law that deals with paying homage for food, the three sisters, the clothes, faith keepers maintaining ceremonies, all of that that we talk about in the Guyana Rasarat Goa is actually reaffirmed in his teachings. So he doesn't get rid of the great law or replace it. And he prepares people for watching for the signs for the end of days. Uh, he talks about George Washington and that war. Uh, there's going to be odd animal behavior. There's going to be metal going through the forest, breathing fire vehicles, right? Pandemics will come. There'll be change in weather, medicine wars. Uh, uh, people will be boasting about making victims of other people by putting bad medicine on them. This is what they talk about, right? And that uh, f because there were so many people dead, uh, in the future times, there were going to be people who were victims of a past life trauma who are been sent back here to recover their spirit. They got knocked out of them during the wars. So you got bonked in the head, knocked out. Well, some of your spirit is on the ground. Well, they drug you away to die somewhere else, right? So this is how it's talked about in there about past life trauma victims of those wars who are sent back by the ancestors to come and recover their spirit. So they wander around because... And they don't know what's going on because they're they're distracted by all the life. And so that's where some of that trauma comes in that have people then do foolish things, nonsense, and do all kinds of things that are hurtful to each other and all of it. And also in, in the end of days that says the leaders, the people who are leading will throw ashes on one another. That's mm -hmm. what it said distinctly. Keep going. And that there were messengers that uh, were saw part of that. And one, one of the interesting ones is this fourth messenger. This is right from uh, Chief Thomas, who said, the fourth messenger says, there were spikes were driven in my hands and feet and chest when they laid me on the cross. So one of the messengers is a holder of ultimate truth, who actually says that that was uh, the peacemaker who went over there and said before he left to go across the salt water, this was going to happen to him, but he'd come back. That's what he said. Okay. And that there will also be uh, the star beings will come back and walk among us. That's the Ojiston Kwesonga. They will come back. But also at that time, you'll have uh, a great movement of the children who are saying, stop it. Stop fighting. Please stop fighting. And that's what's being said now very strongly by all those kids out there who watch us arguing with each other and throwing ashes on we, with each other and so on. But the children who are walking around them are the, the star beings or the Ojistongwe Soa who are on the other side of the sky world where Sky Chief is. Go again. And, okay, I, I won't say too much again about the calamities but they talked about that as part of the end of days there would be a uh, social upheaval but there's also calamities coming that we can't escape from go again and also don't blame george washington for everything uh, we'll come away from that and i'll uh as, as i say this is Guy Rio, and there's a lots in there, and I don't, uh, I actually think it's important not to ignore it or say, oh, well, that doesn't exist because it did this. It's just blaming again. Handsome Lake is to blame for all of our trouble. Joseph Brandt is to blame for our, all of our trouble. The women are to blame for all, all, everybody else is to blame, right? And that's not practical or reasonable or common sense either if we know how human, human humans are. I'll stop for a second and let, uh, Renee, uh, I'll invite Renee to close us off for today. If Jody and Sherry come back in. 
Well, thank you. Yeah, um, it's um, so amazing how um, how life unfolds. It shows us that every one of us will have life experience. We'll fall, but don't stay there to get back up. But we have a tendency to blame and stuck get stuck there. But we have been given these mentors to tell us things happen. And, you know, take this and raise yourself back up again. And the most important thing, the message that we'd like to leave you with today is that um, these are real people. These are real people. They've gone through a lot of struggles. They've gone with, you know, backstabbing and everything. And it seems like we're falling back into that, that scenario again. But to remember that we've been given instructions. We've been given this. We just... We try to do it in one hour, but you can't do it in one hour. You have to do it in a longer version. But thank you, Mike, because we did show you reality that, you know, there's there's hope. And this is what I like to see is that these are the stories we need to tell our children of resilience, of coming back, of re, re, renewing them. And so um, the message is still here. And we invite you to come and hear more because it's this time of resilience, the time of brushing ourselves off and getting back up and hearing hearing what need to be heard today. Oh, it's difficult. No, it's reality. And let's let us see these stories so that we can rise. And this is what we have shared today is the story of resilience and how you can become as they say, your fire comes back up again. And this is what we're here today, is to, to show you, to be here, to hear the stories of resilience. And this is the purpose of what we are here today for, is the purpose of bringing back those, those fires, your fire, everyone's fire, the family fire, the community fire, the leadership fire. All these fires have been, as they say, been... And so now we are here to restore that. And so I say, yeah, uh, miigwech. Thank you for joining us today. And stay tuned because there is so much more. We try to give you our best in this time that we have. But what, whatever was given, it was clear. It was logic. And it was good for us to take in. And so we say, now to all those ancestors that left us this message to give to you. And so we say, oh, ho. Mm. Mm. messages of love and hope and resilience all of that and, and what i actually if i could just share this because i felt something as you were speaking i wasn't in the space to to watch and i was closing my eyes and i felt like my spirit needed to hear these words and it's like we need to start these sessions the next uh, five sessions with not not a warning, but like a uh, you sh you know to prepare yourselves for the information that's coming, mm -hmm. because this is really deep. It is mm -hmm. penetrated mm -hmm. so deep for me, and I'm I'm really in gratitude and look forward to these days. Um, Uncle Mike, Grandmother Renee, I'm so in love mm -hmm. with every other Friday, mm -hmm. and so are so are our listeners as well. They're they're so they're they're just asking where can i learn more where can i learn my stories where can i learn this and of course we said tune in every other friday <laughs> renee you're like you're you're becoming a a professional <laughs> we love this have a wonderful yeah. weekend thank wonderful you weekend. so much for mm -hmm. joining us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.